Hello everyone, now we will cover the chapter 4, it is our fourth week and what we look at today is differences in culture. Let's start with learning objectives and first one is <coughs> explain what is meant by the culture of a society. Then we will identify the forces which lead to differences in social culture. Later on we will look at and identifying the business and economic implications of differences within culture. And finally, recognize how differences in social culture and how these differences affect values in the workplace. So let's introduce what is this thing called culture. We have cross-cultural literacy within the literature. It's an understanding of how cultural differences that arose within nations can affect the way business is practiced. So to what extent the businesses can change the behavior considering the cultural differences. What is culture then? We have several definitions within the literature and there are also debates about whether the culture is should be considered or not, but as we are having an international business model, you can understand that it's important and we need to think carefully about the culture. So, according to Hofstadt, it's collective programming of the wind which distinguishes the members of one human group from another. So by this, we can distinguish the human beings among their behaviors as they have collective bargaining, collective programming, collective attitudes. Also, Taylor explains it as complex, whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, laws, custom, and other capabilities occurred by man as a member of society. If we carry on, we can see that Hofstad and Weber weave culture as a system of values and norms that are shared among a group of people. So what are the norms? Norms are the social rules and guidelines that recommend appropriate behavior in particular situations. So these are the things that make us to control our behavior or the way how we behave in any circumstances. And we have values. These are abstract ideas about what a group believes to be good, right and desirable. So these are the things that we try to perform, we try to do in our daily life. And we have the term called society. It's a group of people who share a common set of values and norms. So in a situation where there are common rules, common values and common norms, we said there is a society. While a society may be equivalent to a country, some countries have several societies, in other words, multiple cultures. And some societies embrace more than one country. So we can have a society which is valid, which the behavior is valid within different countries, or we can have a country with multiple cultures. So what determines the culture, how the culture is formed? The values and norms of culture do not emerge and do not fully form, so they do not emerge in a day. They evolve over, the over time in response to a number of factors, which are firstly, political and economic philosophies. The social structure of the society, how the so society is formed up. The dominant religion within that country, within that society. Language. And education. We have a short video which also shows how the culture is formed and what it includes.
if we carry on after our video, we have social structure, which is a society's social structure refers to its basic social organization. Although social structure consists of many different aspects, two dimensions are particularly important when we would like to explain the difference between the cultures. And the first one is the degree to which the basic unit of social organization is the individual as opposed to the group. To what extent individual it is when we compare within the group. And if we make it generalized, in general, Western societies tend to emphasize the primary of the individual, whereas group tend to figure much larger in many other societies. So group thinking, if it is common, we can say it is another norm, degree, and if the individual is more important, individual behavior is more important, is normally in Western countries. So if we carry on, the second dimension of the social structure is the degree to which a society is stratified into classes. Some societies are characterized by relatively high degree of social stratification and relatively low mobility between strata. So if you, from one class, you can't change your class that easily. On the other hand, other societies are characterized by low degree of social stratification and high mobility between that levels. Americans for this example, and the previous example can be India, there is really high degree of stratification and there is really relatively low mobility within the stratas. Okay, what about culture and the workplace? How the culture affects us in the workplace and in our behaviors? So the most famous study of how culture relates to the values in the workplace was undertaken by Hofstadt. Professor Hofstadt collected data on employee attitudes, values, how they behave, how they act, what they value. Within more than 100,000 employees from 1967 to 1973. So it was six years of research he undertake. And this data enabled him to compare dimensions of culture across 40 countries. By using this data, he isolated dimensions that he claimed summarized different cultures. So first one is the power distance. This dimension expresses the degree to which the less powerful members of society accept and expect that the power is distributed unequally. <coughs> Sorry. The fundamental issue here is how a society handles inequalities among people. So people in societies exhibiting a large degree of power distance accept a hierarchical order in which everybody has a place and which needs no further justification. So if you are in the high hierarchy, top hierarchical level, you are top and you will be become and in a position that people will act you treat you in a better way of they treating others. So there is an equality and they accept it. On the other hand, in the societies with low power distance, people strive to equalize the distribution of power and demand justification for inequalities of power. So they look for equality. The second dimension, individualism versus collectivism. So the high side of this dimension is called individualism, and it can be defined as a preference for losing it social framework in which individuals are expected to take care of only themselves and their immediate families. Opposite side, collectivism, represents a preference for tightly knit framework in a society in which individuals can expect their relatives or members of particular in-group to look after them in exchange for unquestioning loyalty. So in the individualist countries, self-interest is more common approach. But in the collectivist countries, the group thinking and taking care of others is also important. And if you are a business guy, and if an individualist country, if you talk about 
we, 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 we people may not be affected. On the other hand, if we were in a collectivist country and if we start to talk about, I will do this, I will appoint you, I will take care of this, then the group thinking will not like it. A society's position on the dimension is affected whether people's self-image is defined in terms of I or V, as I already given you an example. Another dimension, masculinity versus femininity. The masculinity side of the dimension represents a preference in the society for achievement, heroism, assertiveness, and material rewards for success. Society at large is more competitive. On the opposite side, femininity stands for a preference for cooperation, modesty, caring for the weak, and quality of life. Society at large is more consensus oriented. And in the business context, masculinity versus femininity is sometimes also related to as tough versus tender cultures. Another dimension is uncertainty avoidance index. So this dimension expresses the degree to which the members of society feel free to uncomfortable with uncertainty and amb ambiguity. So if I don't know what will happen, to what extent I am relaxed, or am I relaxed if I don't know what will happen tomorrow? So fundamental issue in here is how a society deals with the fact that the future can never be known. Should we try to control our future? Or just let it happen? Countries exhibiting strong uncertainty awareness index maintain a rigid codes or beliefs and behavior, and they are intolerant of unorthodox behavior and ideas, so they do not want to try new things. And as you can expect, in the first weeks we had entrepreneurship. In these countries, the entrepreneurship activities will be low because they will be afraid of trying new things and failure will be really embarrassing for them. So the innovation and entrepreneurship will be really low for the countries which have high index for un un uncertainty awareness. On the other hand, the weak uncertainty awareness societies maintain a more relaxed attitude in which practice counts more than principle. So they are low, as a society-wise, they are more willing to practi practice and make it perfect than the rigid principles. As you can guess, the entrepreneurship activities, entrepreneurial activities will be more within the weak uncertainty avoidance indexes. Another dimension is long-term versus short-term orientation. So society has to maintain some links with its own past while dealing with the challenges of present and the future. Society prioritizes these two goals differently. Societies who score low on the dimension, for example, prefer to maintain time on it within traditional norms while weaving societal change with suspicion. Those with a culture which scores high, on the other hand, take a more pragmatic approach. They encourage the thrift efforts in modern education as a way to prepare for the future. In the business context, dimension is like a short term versus long term. So short term can be called normative versus long term, which is called pragmatic. And last but not least, indulgence versus restraint. So indulgence stands for a society that allows relatively free gratification of basic and natural human drivers related to enjoying life and having fun. So feel free to do anything if you want. Society allows you. On the other end, we have restraint stand for a society that suppresses gratification of needs and regulates by means of strict social norms. So you are not free that much and you can stop the behaviors or you can't behave as you wish if the society doesn't allow you. Okay, we have another video which will summarize these dimensions also and it will be helpful for you to watch it.
In today's globalized business environment, many of us work with people from different backgrounds and different cultures. This can pose new challenges when it comes to communication and motivation, especially when we're working with people who are based in other parts of the world. One way to understand these people better is to use Dr. Heert Hofstede's cultural dimensions. These are five dimensions that distinguish one culture from another. The first dimension is power distance. This describes how a culture responds to people with power and how it treats those who don't have it. The second dimension is individualism. This refers to the strength of the ties people have with others in their community. People in countries that score high in individualism are likely to value privacy. People in countries with a low individualism score will likely take more interest in other people's well-being. The third cultural dimension is masculinity. This dimension refers to how a culture views the traditional roles of men and women. For instance, a country with a high masculinity score often sees men and women working in distinct, gender-defined roles. People in countries with a low score believe that men and women are equally capable of doing any task. The fourth dimension is Uncertainty Avoidance Index. This defines how well people cope with situations where the outcome is uncertain. Cultures with a high score in this dimension need structure and rules to feel comfortable. Cultures with a low score are more likely to take risks and accept change. The last cultural dimension is Long-Term Orientation. This looks at how a culture values long-standing traditions. Cultures that have a high long-term orientation show respect for tradition. Older people get more admiration, and education and training credentials are important. Cultures with a low score in this dimension believe more in equality. They're more creative and expressive. Keep in mind that these five dimensions won't apply to everyone in a specific culture, but you can use them to guide you when you work with people from different backgrounds and countries. Now, Read the article that accompanies this video to learn more about each dimension. The article also links to Dr. Hofstede's website, which has detailed information on how specific countries score in each dimension. So, as we summarize all the findings within the video, what we had this week, differences in culture. Differences are valid and each culture has differences within the country wise and it may affect the business we will perform within a specific country. The cultural concept in business is a debate going many years on so you can have further reading if you want and I will provide you with some references. The hill is the main cortex and also Hofstede's books is really valuable, will be valuable for you to read about it. So in case of any questions and further clarification, feel free to send me an email anytime and we can also live session on from our platform. See you next week.